Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program. As part of our Los Angeles Mayoral Series, it is my pleasure to introduce today's very special program with Mayor Eric Garcetti, who will be discussing key challenges facing the next Los Angeles mayor. Today's program will be moderated by politics professor Dan Schnur. Dan and Mayor Garcetti, may I invite you to come on screen? It's, hi, Dan. Hey, Kim, how are you? It's great to see you. It's so great for you to moderate yet another program. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us again. Great to see you, Kim, and always great to be with you, Dan. <laughs> Thanks for Let having me. Let me turn this both over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kim. And thanks to all of us for joining you today. I'm really excited for this conversation, Mr. Mayor. Um, I haven't gotten to say this yet, but I will remind our audience that Eric Arcetti is not only the mayor of Los Angeles, but in fact, he is the longest serving mayor of Los Angeles since Tom Bradley, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Right. Because uh, the eight uh, years of term limits since we changed our election dates on the extra, uh, the guy who gets extra time a year and a half um, as we adjust that calendar. So um, I think as long as term limits stay in place, it'll be longest besides Tom Bradley, yes. Okay, well, one more thing you can add to an illustrious, uh, you can add to an illustrious <laughs> record. And of course, we don't know how much longer we're going to have you as our mayor. We're watching the United States Senate with bated breath and very, very excited uh, to uh, look forward to the opportunity that you'll have to represent us as our nation's ambassador to India. It looks as if you are leaving from one quiet and calm position to another. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I seek those really chills and places to be in those positions that really don't require much work. So. <laughs> well, look, we're, we're especially grateful to have you with us today, Mr. Mayor, because as you know, uh, the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall has begun a series examining the mayoral campaign uh, for the man or woman who will be elected this November uh, as, your, as your successor. And I want to clarify for our audience before we get started, we have not asked the mayor here as a political pundit or handicapper. I have no doubt he'd be skilled in both roles, but that's not the job that we elected him to do. But we thought uh, Kim McCleary and Claire Krellitz and the rest of the team at the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall, we thought it would be a particularly valuable opportunity to talk to the mayor as one of the very few people who's held this office to offer some of your insights on what we should be looking for in our next mayor and what you see as that next mayor's greatest challenges going forward. So clearly you won't uh, be endorsing a candidate for mayor, but more broadly, Mr. Mayor, having held this job for the years that you have, what qualities should the voters of Los Angeles be looking for as they weigh the decision they face as do our city's next leader? Well, that's such a great question, Dan. And by the way, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, I am a lifetime, lifetime ride or die fan. Um, since from the time I was like you, a USC professor and took my students to a World Affairs Council uh, meeting with Kofi Annan, who was then at the time the UN Secretary General. So thank you for filling this space in a city that quite frankly doesn't always have the strongest civic DNA. You really pour a lot of, um, of, of energy into trying to remind us that we share one civic space, and I'm very indebted to that. Um, you know, I really appreciate your framing, too, because I think all of us take sports. We all know how the quarterback, the coach, should have played the game, right? We're all, some of us have played those sports, most of us haven't. We watch a football game, we're like, if they had only done X, Y, and Z. And it's such a different thing than if you've ever been a coach or been a quarterback in the NFL, or whatever the position is. And I think it's similar in politics. Uh, politics is sometimes not seen as a profession or a craft. It's just like, hey, if you're successful in business or you're successful over here or there, you could probably just be an elected official. When in reality, being CEO of a city as big as the city of Los Angeles really requires, I think, a long time to know how things work unless you want to have somebody catching up uh, in the first couple of years that they're mayor. But the qualities too, I always say that when people vote for mayor, it's different than voting for a legislator or even for president to some extent. The president is closest. 
Um, when you're looking at legislators, you think about your ideology and whether she or he matches it. You think about the issues that matter. Those things matter in a mayoral race, but I think more than anything else, it's almost deciding on a parent, a parent for the city and voting for a feeling where people are willing to go a little further outside their own ideology for the character of two things I think they want. Somebody who knows how to run things, who will actually fix the things that are broken in the system or respond to the call to pave the street or uh, to clean up the you know, sidewalk, whatever it is. And second, they want somebody who they trust to make the judgment calls for the things we don't know are gonna happen. We never knew a pandemic would happen, but somebody who can steer us through an emergency, somebody who can have the vision to build the city of the future. So I think it's much more personality driven than resume driven. It's much more uh, kind of the human qualities you bring rather than uh, the professional experiences, though those are important. And I think the last thing I'd say is the most important quality to me as mayor in a town as cut up into as many pieces as LA is your ability to work with others. We have a vision of the mayor being the solitary, you know, General Pershing uh, kind of model, the Teddy Roosevelt, the, the, it's always been a man. So it's that, that man who goes by himself and by sheer force of will brings the city along. Well, you can't get anything done in LA that way. You have 87 other cities. You have to work well in the metro system, which does our public transportation. You have to look at the region. You have to know how to work well with Sacramento and Washington. So I think the best quality people should be looking for is really somebody who works well with others, who has a bold vision of the future and who you trust their humanity. Um, get those things together, plus a little knowledge of how City Hall works, and you've got, I think, your perfect mayor. Okay. And of course, you'll, you've left it to each of us to decide which man or woman fits that description, which is exactly as, as it should be. You so see, you made several really interesting points, Mr. Mayor, with all of which I'd love to follow up on, but that would keep you here several hours longer than we have allotted to us. So I want to pick on, on, uh, up on just one of them. And you talked about experience. And obviously, different candidates bring different types of experience into the campaign, into the mayor's office. And certainly, your predecessors came from a variety, a variety of different backgrounds and, and perspectives. But even someone who is as steeped in city government as you have been, I have to imagine that once you sit down in that chair, the world does change pretty considerably. And one of the things I've heard over the years from mayors, from governors, even from presidents, is that no matter how well prepared you are before you become the chief executive in a position like yours, what a learning curve there is. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind if you can look back to those first days in office all those all those years ago, what do you what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you first took office? Well, I think you're right, Dan. I'd been witness for 12 years to two mayors, Mayor Hahn and Mayor, Mayor Viragosa, worked very closely with them, was city council president for six years under Mayor Viragosa. So I kind of thought, I knew, I know City Hall. I know I can name all the departments. I know where the bathrooms are. I have this record in my own district of tripling the number of parks and reducing graffiti by 85%, building housing and all those things. Then suddenly you become chief executive. And I think it's not just going from council member to mayor. There are a few Angelinos. We all think we know LA. Unless it's your job to crisscross from Chatsworth down to San Pedro, from Boyle Heights to Brentwood every single day, you don't really get a sense of just how ginormous this place is, just in how incredibly vast, diverse, and the challenge of trying to stitch together the story of LA, not only of the present, but who we want to become. So what do I wish I knew? I think I wish I knew that a lot of people sometimes just want you to make a quick decision and to guide. They've elected you to just do it. And internally, I'm, my style is to really uh, trust staff, trust communities, wait for process to come up. Well, that's, I think, the right way to govern most of the time. But at least 20, 30 percent of the time, they just want you to make the decision and implement. And so, you know, when I was looking to raise the minimum wage at the beginning, something that's helped us reduce our poverty by 27 percent in Los Angeles. There was a lot of opposition, both from the left and the right. I had, you know, um, some folks in the union movement saying, go slower. We're going to do that later and we want to do it statewide. We had some folks in the business community saying, you'll ruin the economy. And I think I learned after kind of waiting a year, let's just dive in and do it. And that was a good lesson to learn because you have a very short time to be chief executive. Eight years, eight and a half years, almost nine now might sound like a lot, but it's not. And it goes by so quickly. Second thing. I, uh, 
I learned this pretty quickly too, but I didn't know it going in. You're going to be defined not by the things you set out to do and how well you do them, but the things you don't expect to happen and how well you respond to them. I don't mean that just as an individual as mayor, but I think that's what defines a city. Those things in leadership where people watch the reaction to a pandemic, to a homelessness epidemic, to the things that you don't, a fire that occurs. It's really those moments when your character is shared and you become closest to your people in that shared struggle, both good and bad with the most pressing challenges you didn't necessarily expect to happen. And then third, I would say, and this is how I've approached stuff. Again, I don't know if it's a lesson that I wish I'd known, but I learned pretty quickly. Uh, maybe I should have learned it even faster. Don't worry about the criticisms of today. Don't get hung up about the headlines of tomorrow. And I tell my staff this, imagine that you're Dan Schner 10 years from now. Imagine you're Eric Garcetti 10 years from now, insert your name. And you're looking back on the decision you're making today. From that vantage point, are you doing the right thing? Because Mike Bloomberg, who I visited early on when we overlapped as mayors, said the things people like me the most for today are the ones they hated me the most for then. So don't worry about those sort of criticisms. You're not in this for your time in office. You're really setting it up for the next decade after you leave office. Well, once again, several several fascinating points. I think the most important by far being worrying less about the immediacies of public opinion and rather focusing more on the long-term necessities of a city, which my uneducated guess is, is probably easier said than done. But um, let me let me ask you this: As we begin to look now uh, to the future, given all that you have accomplished over the course of your years in office, I know that there's still goals on which you've made progress, but still want to see further progress. So I'm going to ask you somewhat of an unfair question: and That is, of all the things that you've prioritized and worked on over the years, what is the most important task that you've taken on that you hope that the next mayor Will, will complete or at the very least move forward? Well, I would say, you know, I, I, I try to keep it simple. I try to say, let's restore, let's go back to basics and restore city services that for so long have been neglected. Our street rating had gone down for 40 years and now it's gone up for eight years. Our 911 calls or our DWP calls were a half hour, 45 minutes on hold. Now it's one or two minutes most. You know, those things that just were about making city hall work. But then second, I wanted to kind of build the city of the future by creating a really vibrant economy and investing in infrastructure. So from the airport where we're finally getting a people mover and investing $15 billion, the port, and then measure M, which to me is the most important thing for the next mayor to be focused on transportation because it links into everything else. We'll be building 15 rapid transit lines, but they're all gonna need more money than probably even that measure provides. Um, I would couple that with housing. I mean, if you ask me the number one, two, and three issues in California, but also Los Angeles, it's housing, housing, and housing. And that's why we're stuck in traffic. That's why we have environmental degradation. It's why uh, companies can't uh, find uh, room to grow here sometimes. I mean, there's other things that are involved and you don't have to be homeless, but it's definitely the homelessness crisis is the tail end of our housing crisis, but you don't have to be homeless to feel, well, my kids aren't staying here unless I'm in a rich family or they're inheriting the house. My middle managers don't see how they can see a future here because for 40 years we've neglected building enough housing. Um, so when I became mayor, we were building a third less housing per year than right now. So you heard that right, we haven't just doubled, not increased by 50%, we've tripled the amount of housing built each year. I would tell my successor, double that again. And there's some things which in the past we got a lot of opposition to, for instance, take SB 9 and 10, very controversial, but SB 10 allows, these are Senate bills at state level that passed, um, transit-oriented development. So if you're building a bus line or have one or a rail line, let's get more dense there. Well, we've done that in Los Angeles and 50% of our new housing is along those lines. It's been a magical kind of way to build greater density and by the way, build affordable units on the back of the developers without us putting a single subsidy in. Um, our accessory dwelling units, we're about 3% granny flats, the artist formerly known as granny flats, they're about <laughs> 2 or 3% of our Buildings, when I came in, it's now 25% of our new buildings are people building in their own backyards, being able to rent those out, um, in some cases to people who have formerly been homeless. Um, and SB9, the most controversial of all, takes the single family area, non-historic neighborhoods, and allows you to cut your property in two and then put two homes on each of those new slices, so four where there was one. And I understand people's fears about that. They say, I want to preserve my neighborhood. 
But in most neighborhoods, there's already two or three, maybe sometimes four families living in that one house because we have such a shortage. And so we have to figure out a way to be able to add more housing. And I think so really it's see the transportation stuff through, get the housing done and see through the Green New Deal that we put forward that will make us pretty immune from droughts and get us to 100% renewable energy so that we can deal with climate change. I would put those at the very top. Uh, last thing, homelessness is obviously related in its own slice to housing, but also transcends housing because it really involves in the worst cases, the most traumatic cases for all of us, mental health. And this is really frustrating because whether it's public health, mental health or other things, people don't understand the mayor and the city don't have any power, don't have any jurisdiction, don't have any people and don't have any departments. That's usually at, this, at the county, state or federal level. We need a right to public health. Sorry, let me get the, we, we, we preserve our, uh, our energy here, conserve our energy, so I have an automatic dimmer. Um, so we, we need to conserve, you know, whatever we can do to look at making sure that we have public health, but more importantly, mental health for everybody. And until we have a right to housing and a right to mental health in this country, it was uh, Willie Brown who recently said in an interview, he was gonna do a huge summit on homelessness in San Francisco after he came there and it was as bad there as it is here, um, getting worse up there. He convened, everybody invited them and then the day before he canceled it saying, there's no way a mayor can change this. And up there, they at least have the city and county together. And I think it's very true. I don't run away from it. I've run to this. I've taken responsibility for solving it because somebody has to, but the next mayor will have homelessness through her or his entire term if we don't get that sort of federal help, uh, that entitlement program that we have with food and with healthcare in this country applied to housing. So for those of you who may have missed it, we can add to the list of Mayor Eric Garcetti's accomplishments, being the first mayor that I know of who can so seamlessly work in a reference to the artist formerly known as Prince into an answer on housing policy. So well, very, very, very impressively done. Um, so you've given some really good advice to your potential successors um, on this incredibly vexing issue of housing and homelessness. The other issue that at least right now seems to be poised to dominate the mayor's race is the issue issues relating to criminal justice and public safety. Mm -hmm. And this is incredibly, this is an incredibly difficult issue for a city like ours, because on one hand, we saw many Angelinos who took to the streets in very, uh, in, in, in very uh, understandable protest two years ago after the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor advocating for very aggressive police reform. On the other hand, it's clear that we have many Angelinos who, while they want to see the excesses of the police department addressed, also have great concerns about the level of public safety for them and their families. What kind of advice would you give to the next mayor on how to balance those imperatives? Well, one of the reasons I think Dan Schneer should have his own talk show is because you do frame these things, I think, very, um, well, just much more sophisticated than the way probably the mayor's race will play them out and that we hear on the news. Um, public safety is job one. That isn't lip service. I think it's the core of what we do and it's the biggest amount of spending that we have in the city of Los Angeles around both police and fire together. If you take our proprietary departments of the airport, port and DWP out, um, it's over half of our budget between those two departments. Add public works, that's 75 cents of every dollar. So everything else we do is in that last quarter uh, our libraries, our zoo, our parks, our, uh, and a lot of people want us to do more, but they forget there's a school district that takes care of schools, a county that takes care of mental health and health are supposed to, you know, do those sorts of things. Um, and we're often in this debate, Dan, forced to choose a side, and it's the wrong approach. Are you pro-cop or do you not believe in cops? Are you, should we defund the police or even abolish the police? Are you pro, uh, you know, mental health care or are you against this? Are you against racism or are you going to uh, tolerate racist cops? And it's just so false. The police officers I've worked with for 20 plus years are heroes and human beings. And any that aren't, just like there's politicians who aren't and wherever you, whoever's listening to this in your workplace, there's somebody who probably has been bad in that profession as well. They need to pay the price and you need to set up systems that don't throw everything on their shoulders. So my philosophy has been the, the following, and I'm really excited about this morning because I just came before this interview from Fire Station 4, where I went up to the 911 dispatch, I went to a training of new mental health workers, 
and outside saw the new mental health care vans, that the County of Los Angeles has trained practitioners um, in mental health and peer counselors together with a driver that we're paying for from the city and, the and we're housing them in fire stations. In one place on Sunday, it'll be the West Side and then two in South LA and one in the Valley. So five of these vans that will 24 seven respond to 911 calls and deal with those, that trauma that we see on the street. This morning, there was a guy yelling outside my house at 6 a.m. who woke me up, screaming at nothing. And all you can do is call 911 in the past and either get a firefighter or a police officer. And nine out of 10 times, those people aren't a danger to anybody. They might feel traumatizing, but in that one out of 10 times, we can still call the cop out. We can still call the, the firefighter out if we need. But in the first month we've done this downtown, 113 calls, instead of transporting them to a hospital where there's no mental health care for them, we've reduced by 80% the number of transports to hospitals. And instead, we've been able to transport them to clinics, uh, to some cases to mental health hospitals, and to get people treated so that tomorrow somebody else isn't calling to deal with that mental health. Now that's just one slice of public safety, but let's get the stats right. Anybody who experiences uh, a crime is one too many, and those are traumatizing, and I never say to somebody who's experienced that, that your experience isn't real and that we haven't, shouldn't focus on it. Second, it's the safe, safest decade in our city's history. And while across the country, shootings and homicides have gone up, the overall crime is still flat at a historic low level, but I wanna see it go down even further. I think we need to choose about making sure we hire back police officers that we've lost in the last year or two due to retirements and also hire more clinicians. You don't have to choose between, are you for hiring police officers and making sure there's a quick response time, you don't wait three hours when you call the cops for something serious, or knowing that a police officer maybe shouldn't be called out to a suicide or a threatened suicide. And as instead, as we've done with Dee Dee Hirsch, another pilot we've put forward, we now have trained suicide prevention counselors who have probably saved more lives and a badge sometimes will trigger somebody. And those officers don't even get enough information to go out there to know that this person has a, a history of mental health problems. So let's save lives. I'm very proud that we've reduced fatal police shootings as of a couple years ago to 96 out of 100 per capita of all the major cities in America. That we have great training going on, that we have interventionists who are former gang members instead of police officers to work with a lot of gang violence. Um, and we have to look at co-owning public safety would be my message to the city and to everybody running. Don't pick a side. Do yes and instead of either or. Smart advice, not just on criminal justice and public safety issues, but probably across the board. As I said earlier, uh, we're not gonna have nearly enough time to delve into as many of the city's policy challenges and your policy accomplishments as we'd like. I mean, we can go through the same type of questions about advice you'd offer to your successor on jobs and economic growth, on transportation, on just an overwhelming number of, of policy matters. But I do wanna to get to our audience questions because as you could probably guess, Mr. Mayor, that's when the program gets much more interesting and much more intelligent when I step aside and our really, really smart audience takes over with their questions that, that Claire will be offering you. So maybe what I can do uh, is, 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 is sum up a little bit rather than going through issue by issue. You've offered really important advice to the next mayor on the issues of homelessness and housing and on the issues of crime and public safety, more broadly, not necessarily on a particular policy matter, although perhaps if there are those that you'd, you'd still wanna cover, more broadly, what advice would you give to the next mayor about leading the city forward? You talked earlier about the role of the mayor in terms of working with others, with city council, with state and federal government, but for that person who's about to sit down in the chair the same way that you did, you know, back in 2013. What kind of advice do you give that man or woman? So, um, you know, and I'll, and I'll do this actually probably both in person and in letter form. Um, on one hand, I have the joke letter. I was telling a few people, I said, so much of what we've done, I was telling my team, is really about the future. The next mayor, he or she, if she's there for uh, eight years, will see, you know, a dozen rail lines get built or begin, 11,000 units of um, uh, homeless housing get completed, the Olympics and Paralympic Games will come. Um, the airport will open with a people mover finally that takes a train to the planes and brand new terminals um, across the board. And so I was joking, I was gonna say, this is all the fun you're gonna have, just don't screw this up, love, Eric. Because on one <laughs> hand, I think we're really queued up for a great decade, even as we confront some challenges. But in terms of the how you approach the job, I would say a couple of things. 
One is cross boundaries with abandon while you still respect them. What do I mean by that? We are a single region of 19 million people, the third largest metro economy in the world after Tokyo and New York, and we're basically tied with New York. We might cut ourselves into five counties and in this county into 88 cities and unincorporated areas. But anything I've been able to do is, being, for instance, community college, I don't have any authority over our community colleges, but I helped make community college free by raising that money privately, getting first year free, and then the state followed. So we did a second year and then the state followed. And now we have free transit, laptops, jobs for folks who are going to community college. And in two years, we've had 40% more public school students going into community college than not. Now, if I had respected that boundary, or if I, sorry, if I had not crossed that boundary, that never would have happened. But I respected it and worked really closely with our amazing community college district and board. Same thing with my 87 fellow mayors. Every three months for the first time ever, I convened the LA County mayors. And because traditionally, everybody loves to hate the LA city mayor, right? At least the headlines, other politicians. You get 90% of the headlines and the supervisors and other mayors saying, but you're only 40% of the population. So I tried to invert that. How can I use the power of getting those headlines and opening those doors in Washington and Sacramento and advocate for the region? whether it's earthquake assistance, whether it's getting the Olympics and putting those events in other cities around us, what could I do to move around and to convene those mayors so we'll visit South El Monte or we'll visit Long Beach and, and they can show their cities off to the rest of their fellow mayors. So I would say, or, or whether it was the pandemic, when we don't even have a public health department, but that didn't stop me from being a public health leader and working really well with the chair of the board of supervisors and Barbara Ferrer, because we had this army of firefighters who could stand at the largest testing center in the world, um, who could uh, you know, pull together the civilian uh, employees of core and the fire department to be able to get vaccinations out and so much more. My real strong advice would be those three C's that I say of constitutional, or in our case, charter power, your coercive power of saying, you know, twisting people's arms, whether that's elites or business community or others and getting things done, or your convening, which people always forget that last one, convening power, offer to be the place where the teachers union and the school district can round the clock convene so that we can make sure we negotiate the end of a strike for our schools and get our kids back to school, convene, convene people and do it with humility and strength at the same time. Okay. So I, I, I lied, I'm gonna ask one last question before I turn it over to Claire and our audience because you talked about many of the things on which you've worked that will still come to fruition long after you've left this office. So I need to ask you honestly, Mr. Mayor, when the LA Olympics 2028 take place and another mayor welcomes the world to LA, isn't that gonna make you at least a little bit mad? Not, not at all. I, I, I tell my team I need nothing named after me. I'm an Angelino at heart and I can't wait to be a former mayor enjoying my city. And whether anybody knows it or not to say, with my daughter, this rail line we're on, you know, daddy helped this, this happen. Or sit there like I did with my parents at the closing ceremonies of the 84 Olympics with my daughter, Maya. When I went after it, it was actually after I paved a street in LA, my very first day, first action in the Valley. I then came back and wrote a letter to the Olympic Committee saying we want the Olympics. And we were originally going for 2024. The math worked out that my daughter would have been 13 then, but we got the 28 Olympics, so she'll be 17. Um, no, I think it's going to be amazing. And you saw in a poll, you know, nearly 80% of the city still backs the Olympics, even when we know that they've been troubled. But LA always is a games changer. In 32 we were, in 84 we were. I think we can show people you don't have to spend money to have a great games and you can actually have a social conscience with it too. So no, I, I'd love to have taken the flag from, um, from Paris and then handed off to whoever my successor is. That'll happen in two and a half years. But no, I'll be just that happy guy in the stands with the sunglasses and the Olympic hat on cheering on the home team and doing whatever that mayor and uh, Casey Wasserman needs me to do. Well, hopefully you'll get good seats. Yes. I, if I don't get that, then, you know, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. Well, as, uh, as Claire Krellitz joins us, um, um, our amazing media director, um, I'm gonna, one, one last thing. Um, I would be remiss, Mr. Mayor, if I didn't give a shout out to my former students who work all day, every day for you. Um, the amazing Alex Komisar, uh, the communications director. Right over there. Um, right yeah. over here. Um, um, Rebecca Rasmussen, uh, who I knew as Becky Andreessen a long time ago. And more recently, Maddie Terrace and a bunch of others. But um, in addition to everything else you've done for LA, thanks for giving some of my all-star alumni uh, such good jobs.
Well, thanks for being a great assembly line of talent as well. Um, you know, it's either because or despite of you, they've come here and been able to do great work. But thank you, Dan. I think it's because of you. Don't tell me their, what their answers are. Claire, he's all yours. <laughs> thank you so much, Dan, for leading this conversation. And Mayor Garcetti, it's a, a pleasure to join you. Actually, just a few years ago, I was watching you give the commencement speech at my college graduation at Occidental College. So it's very fun to, to be here talking with you. Um, we have a lot of audience questions, so we'll dive right in. The first Good. one asks, what issues do you think are really important to the future of Los Angeles that are not being addressed by the mayoral candidates or in the media right now? It's a great point. Um, well, I think what they're addressing the important ones that I mentioned, housing, but I'd like to see even more from all the candidates on housing that isn't just you know, it's uh, campaigns are campaigns. You need to have a slogan, a kind of something that's catchy. But this is really hard bureaucratic work, and it's convincing the hearts and minds of people to change zoning inside their own neighborhoods. That I think is really where the numbers are to get the housing up. Um, I'd like to see hear more talk about climate. I think they all have really good climate records and have some climate ideas, but that to me is the dominant issue. Um, I'd like to hear more about resilience, um, what they're going to do to build on the work we've done to strengthen buildings and to get ready for the next big one. And then I think fourth, kind of an, a global vision. Where do you place Los Angeles globally? And like, for instance, we're very excited to have, to be the host of the Summit of the Americas. We're gonna have the head of state of every North, Central, South American and Caribbean country in Los Angeles in June. Those are events that usually go to Chicago and New York and obviously Washington DC. We found it in the Federal Register with two days left. We pushed hard for it and we got it. Hold on, gotta turn on the lights again. <laughs> and uh, we um, really need to, I think, take on that ownership of being a global city. And leading up to the Olympics, for instance, we're putting together London's model of tourists, foreign students, investors, and people who want to trade with us. Have it be a one-stop shop. And I'd love to hear the vision from the mayors of how we can take this incredibly global city, one of the top five global cities of the world, uh, ranked actually number one for doing business globally, which you know we don't always get that ranking, but uh, I think all the fundamentals are here and lay out that vision of how you're gonna lead the region um, and get that done too, because I think our future prosperity depends on that position globally too. Thank you. On one of those points, another person asks, how do you think the next mayor can continue to respond to climate change issues that are impacting Angelinos? Well, I hope we've left a marvelous plan and I inherited great work that I had worked on as council president from my predecessor, Mayor Viragosa, who was very strong on this work. Um, I just came back last week from um, New Mexico, and in my last uh, weeks and months as your mayor, I've been saying, well, instead of just working you know, the 14-hour days in the office, let's get out and I want to see some stuff from the airport to uh, the metro uh, stations that are being built. And when actually it was Becca, your former student, Dan, who oversees this as director of infrastructure, said, we're opening up the largest wind farm in U.S. and hemispheric history, maybe world history outside of China. Um, do you want to go? I said, hell yeah. And I got on the road and saw it. And we have about a third of the power coming from that. It'll be 6% of our power. And I've witnessed in my lifetime going from 2% when I was a council member and pushing up a very steep hill to change this to now over 40% renewable uh, and over 61% carbon free power. That's a remarkable statistic. And by the end of the decade, we need to get to the numbers that the National Renewable Energy Lab showed us we could, which is 97% by the end of this decade, 100% by 2035. Um, same thing with water. Stick with our plan and implement it. And I know it's, um, it's going to require a lot of hard work, but to recycle 100% of our water. That is the equivalent of three LA aqueducts. I'm really proud that finally after a 100-year war with Owens Valley, we made peace, went up there and actually signed agreements that allow us to have more water there and more water for us and still mitigate the dust that permeated the valley. But we need to really think about using 100% of our water here. And we're going to move from 15% local water to uh, over 60% local water right here in our backyard if we stick to that. And then lastly, I would say environmental justice. I was so proud to sign in this town that once produced 25% of the world's oil production in the 1920s to ban oil and gas extraction, um, not just in the future, but to wind down as non-conforming the existing wells that we have that really pollute people's lives, that we're the only place that built a mega city on top of a huge set of oil fields. Um, it was good when nobody lived uh, by, you know, uh, Wilshire and La Brea, but now that people live there, it's not a good idea to have those wells there. And places like Wilmington, um, Culver City is doing the same thing. We need to really wind that down. So I'd say environmental justice, 
uh, electrify transportation, zero carbon buildings. We have the five zeros. It's buildings, transportation, electricity, zero waste, zero wasted water. Get those done, and I think we've left you a good roadmap. Thank you so much. This next person asks, what role do you see for the next LA mayor in continuing to promote trade and investment within North America? Well, I would just reference my earlier discussion, join this global LA uh, kind of, it's an independent entity from city hall because we need county-wide coverage and even region-wide coverage. Join it for anybody who's part of a business, please fund us. Uh, when London did this, it was marvelous. It, the payback was like $8 for every dollar put in. We've had great support from local companies already. Um, and I would encourage the next mayor, no matter the criticism you'll get, and I was really bummed to not be able to do it for two years because of COVID, get on the road and sell Los Angeles. I took uh, some people on one of my trade missions to, to Asia and people think that these are junkets. They always like criticize you in the press. We work from eight in the morning to 10 at night every single day. And somebody who'd done this at the state level said, wait a second, I don't want to go on these trips. There's no fun. I said, you're right, there's no fun. There's work to be done. But showing up with our shipping companies, showing up with our investors, showing up with people who want to trade with LA and bringing our companies to those places, we need to continue doing that in Asia. We need to open up new markets in places like India, places like the Middle East, uh, go back to Europe where we take that for granted and, and especially Latin America. Even during the pandemic, we had a trade mission, a virtual one to Kenya and all sorts of good things have come out of that. So I would really encourage the next mayor in the city more broadly to support Global LA, keep a deputy mayor for international relations, something that I pioneered and still the only one in America, Ambassador Nina Hachigian, who is brilliant and has an amazing team. With the world coming in 2028, how could we lose that opportunity when they come here not to show off LA to the world and really gain jobs, investment, and other good things out of that? Yes, absolutely. Um, Ambassador Shigian has been uh, with us at the council a couple of times now, and she's fantastic. So I definitely support that position. Um, this next person asks, earlier you mentioned the mayor needs to stitch together the story of Los Angeles. What is LA's story in your eyes? You know, when I was running, I said I was going to be the storyteller in chief. I think I had a hit piece uh, of me reading a book to kids saying he wants to be a storyteller. And wasn't saying making up stories, I mean telling the narrative. I think, what is it, the book Sapiens that says that's the thing that distinguishes us from other animals is that we can tell stories and remember them and pass them on. In many ways, it's what takes the chaos of this world and makes sense of it. Um, to me, LA's story is kind of threefold. It's a place um, of immense freedom, traditionally, of incredible creativity. And then the third one, which is the most powerful that I've tried to kind of push as our story and stitch together, is a place of belonging. Because I mean, at this moment, everybody's trying to figure out diversity, inclusion. I don't like those words as much because diversity is such a neutral term and inclusion implies somebody has power and is granting it to you and including you. Whereas a sense of belonging equalizes us. To tell an immigrant or a fifth generation Angelino, to tell a African-American girl um, who's growing up in South Los Angeles or a, a Samoan you know, senior uh, in the San Fernando Valley that they all belong. I think really is LA's story when we get it right. But we can't forget the creativity piece. We have to be more, much more creative about public policy in this state. For Democrats, it's all the well-intentioned uh, boulders that we've had, each one pretty good, but by the time you put them all in your backpack, it's so heavy that it's tough to do business uh, quickly and, and it costs a lot more to do it. For Republicans, it's the idea of like, no, we can't spend to invest because usually traditionally we were, just build us freeways, get me water, take care of the rest, a very libertarian place and that doesn't get the job done enough. Uh, but I think our story really is that I witnessed in, um, in the pandemic, an incredibly generous place where the world kind of collides um, at our best, an imperfect paradise. At our worst, we're a place that can't learn how to grow and isn't nimble enough to change and is holding on to the nostalgia of something that will never come back and holds us back. And my, my plea to Angelinos to the next mayor and city council, but more just to everyday Angelinos, is we've got to continue to try new things. We've got to be bold in what we build and what we invest in to lay down that foundation of prosperity for 10 years from now, yes, but also 20 and 30 years from now. I was so proud of the voters when Measure M was passed and it doesn't have a, a sunset date. And Dan will appreciate this from politics. We pulled it, the fewer years we said it lasted, the worse it did which never happens in politics. You have to almost promise, I swear the tax will only be there for five years and then it'll go away. But voters knew 
that a system will need to be built and built and built, and they want their children and their grandchildren not to be stuck in traffic like them. So really it is, I think the story is about how brave we're gonna be about the future. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, a lot of people in the audience who are curious about your next move being US ambassador to India. So I'll combine two questions here. Um, the first is, how are you thinking about your role as US ambassador to India, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine and India's close relationship with Russia? And then second, what specific benefits can both LA and India gain by you becoming our next US ambassador? Well, I'm really sad about leaving and excited about going right now. It's kind of the duality that I live with. I, I hate to leave this city that is home and that I love so much and my friends and family, um, but I'm really excited to represent uh, not just our country, but hopefully represent our city and state when I'm in India, a place that's um, had a hold on me for many, many decades of my life and that I'm excited the president asked me to represent um, the country, the, our country in. I would say it is a really treacherous time. I think we're entering a very dark period of, of uh, global history, but the collective response of the free world, where we have fewer people, by the way, that live in democracy for the first time since after the Cold War than live under democracy. So, I'm sorry, fewer people in democracy than autocracy. So more people live in uh, autocratic states now, population-wise, than democratic states for the first time. India is the world's biggest democracy. We're the world's oldest democracy. So we have to figure out, and we've been really coming together strategically, um, ask Indians, and we poll at the very top of any country, which not a lot of other places we poll that high in. So Indians love Americans, are connected to America. I wanna connect Americans more to India. For instance, more American students study in Costa Rica uh, than in India. And India is about to become the most populous country in the world, third biggest economy soon. Um, and I want to share our values and really promote in India that when we, whether that's domestically, where we both have work always to do to tend to our democracy, or whether that's externally in international organizations, where I think neutrality is not enough anymore. We need to really engage. We need to be able to trust each other. And, and as the question pointed out, yeah, there have been past ties that India has. Let's talk about the future and help them redefine new ties that they can have rather than get upset with what's today. And so I hope to be a very strong voice for our values. And by our values, I mean, of course, American values first, but I think they're mirrored in what has traditionally been Indian values too. If we can get that done, I think the US-India relationship can change um, this next chapter of global history. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That will be the end of our audience questions. I know you have a very busy schedule. So Dan, I'll turn the conversation back over to you. All right, thanks so much, Claire. And thanks as always, to our audience for asking such smart questions and, made me, and making me look so bad by comparison. But as always, you rescue our programs. And as always, we're really grateful to have all of you with us uh, for these conversations. And just a reminder, we're set in the weeks and months ahead to talk with Mike Fuhrer, with Karen Bass, with Kevin DeLeon, still working out the details on Rick Caruso, but with any luck, we'll be able to present conversations with all of the major mayoral candidates, Kim, by the time we wrap this up uh, in June, right? Absolutely. Mayor Garcetti, we are so appreciative of your time and for sharing your very valuable expertise and experience. We just have to have you come back as ambassador to India for more great sharing of your experience. I, I would love that, Kim. Thank you, and thank you to you and Dan and Claire, to everybody who watched. And if I could say one thing in closing, and I promise it's very brief, and it's not a whine about myself, it's really a plea for who comes after me. Please be kind and generous to those who serve, because it's a more and more difficult and toxic place to lead. Um, part of that social media, part of that is that people lost our heads during the pandemic, part of that is people visit people's homes. We might not always agree with our leaders, but we do elect them. And we, are, we do have the gift of living in a democracy. Democracy demands that we not throw fits when we don't get 100% of what we want, but that some days we settle for moving things forward 5%, or even when they move in a different direction, that we still say that these are human beings behind the titles. I think that will strengthen our city. And again, don't do it for me. I've, I've, I'm a guy with both thick and thin skin, because you have to have both. But please, whoever gets elected, support her or support him in really our joint effort of trying to build that city that we dream of. Mayor Eric Garcetti, thank you so much, not just for joining us here today, 
but for all you've done and will continue to do for the city of Los Angeles and its people. Thanks so Thank much. You. Appreciate it. See you soon.